this one is still missing, and then we're good to go. Okay, so we uh, um, Yeah, they are my mistake. Okay, it seems that we are streaming this out. How is uh, how is my uh, <coughs> YouTube officer? Everything's fine. Everything is fine. Very good. So let me make this a little bigger. So these are the animations that I wanted to share with you. So the first one is, you know, this. Some of the animations are like, are, you know, made because of before the Christ. So it's like, you know, more than two thousand years old. Like the one that you can see here in the lower left corner. You know, this is extremely, extremely old animation, and you can tell that when you just look at that how is the visualization. So it's not based on the Unity, it's not based on the Unreal Engine, but it's something that is quite lousy. But the idea is simply to run the system, and you can see that the, you know, the flex, this is described as a flexible bodies. You can see a little bit of deformation of the bodies, but quite significant amount of deformation is coming from the hydraulic actors. So that's a simple animation. And this is this deflection compensator rolls, and now you see the idea. So the idea is that this cell is rotating, and then you're introducing deformation because of these loading shoes. So it's like a special kind of tonal bearings and because of this special kind of tonal bearings they can they are so powerful that they can actually introduce a cross section deformation to this cell component. So that's how it look. And now then finally how is this Mevia modeler? It's the Mevia modeler, you know, this is how the hydraulics look, you know, there is nothing special here. But something that soon you will see is a hydraulic scheme. So that's what the guy is turning on. So this is the hydraulic circuit. Let me hold the animation here. It's not extremely sharp and it's not extremely clear, but you can get an idea. Okay, this many components are needed in real machines. And this many components requires a significant amount of work in order to model them. So you need number of differential equations, you need a number of equations to describe each one of these components. And now to do that manually, that is a, a little bit excessive amount of work. So it's so much easier to use this graphical user interface, and with help of this graphical user, user interface, you can just click the icons, put it in a screen, and then later tell about the parameters that is describing the component. And that's, that is very nice. Okay. So you can make some measurements here, so you can plot it out the pressures in different locations. You can see how the spools are moving when someone is operating the machine. That's typically not visible when you make make an equation by yourself. But these are these are the kind of the information that are quite useful in order to understand better. Right, the, how is that the hydraulic circuit is operating? So, then the guy is doing some kind of tunings, uploading out the pressures, and that's it. That's about that movie. And now, <clears throat> the bulk models. So we look at the in-class, uh, results of the in-class quiz, and we notice that uh, uh, Ninety-seven percent of the students they voted, but they answered the flexibility, compressibility of the hydraulic. That's what the bulk models is about. So it's not about the oil amount of a circuit. It's not about the you know, number of the components. It's not about the forces. We haven't really discussed any of the other items than the compressibility yet. We will do that a little later today. Okay. So that's about the hydraulics. Now the viscosity, I'm going to be quite brief when we look at the viscosity. Again, simply because this affects only when the, the flow is a laminar flow. Flow times comes uh, next week, perhaps. Maybe if we have a time, we can discuss them this week. But most probably it's going to be next week. 
Now let's look at the definition of, uh, of the viscosity in order to make a better understanding, you know, how is that we can define that. You now I have here a setup again, so it's an experiment where I have a plate, plate hold on. Let me use a red color. So the plate is this component here, and, that's, and the plate is on top of the, the fluid film. And the fluid is between the plate that is moving to right side direction because of the force F that is applying the plate. And then I have here a crown. And then when I'm looking, how is a fluid particles? How is their velocity? And how is a velocity profile? If you're dealing with the Newtonian fluids, and those are the fluids we're dealing in when we're speaking about the hydraulics, they will behave in such a way that the velocity of the particle that is very next to crown body, the velocity will be zero. Whereas the velocity of the particle that is very close to the plate will have the exactly same velocity than the plate itself. Others are linearly distributed. So we can make a simple linear assumption that this is the velocity profile along the heat of the fluid field. Okay, so now what we want to do then is that we wanted to estimate the force that is needed in order to introduce this velocity amount of V. And that gives us a definition of, of uh, <clears throat> viscosity. Now, here's a definition of force. So force that is needed in order to introduce this setup must be a function of the cross-section area of the plate, and then it must be a function of something that is called What is this? Newton. What is this letter? So, how do you pronounce this letter? New. Mm -hmm. New. Okay, new. So this new, which is a uh, you know something we are after here. So that's going to be the definition of what of uh, viscosity. And then I have here velocity and the fluid thickness. This is the really that what I would like to to analyze, and this is the one that I would like to get out from this equation. This definition. Now. I would like to take a little bit of further access to this equation, and I would like to introduce something that is called shear force. And by the definition, the shear force is a force divided by cross-section area. Now, using this definition, so it affects here and here, so I can actually describe the shear force that is shown here. So that the shear force is a function of viscosity, velocity, and the fluid thickness. And now all the fluids that we are analyzing or we are looking in this course will behave according to these equations. And this equation is called Newton's law of fluids. And the fluids that are behaving according to this is a Newtonian fluids. And those are exactly the fluids we are analyzing when we're speaking about the hydraulics. Now, that's the viscosity. But not really the way that we would like to use the viscosity. The most typical way to express the viscosity is uh, something that is called kinematic viscosity. The kinematic viscosity, which is, what is this? V, we, no, no, what, what is this, this, this letter? V. The previous one was F. This okay, so, so how it was, so this was not, what, what did I mention? I said eta, did I not? Uh, I, I did. I misheard. Yeah, yeah, you misheard it. So right. later you can check it out from the recording. So it was eta all the time. <laughs> so, uh, or was it not? So eta. So uh, then, uh, then uh, but what the heck is this? Is this even a letter? What, what is this? Okay, now you, even you cannot help me. So uh, it's not surprised that I cannot pronounce these these letters if you don't even know that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What what we we? Anyway, so uh, kinematic viscosity. Can we call it kinematic viscosity? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, makes sense. So we we wrote it, and this is called kinematic viscosity from this on. It's no. No. Oh. No. No. 
Okay, so, uh, so, uh, okay, choices are new, we, kinematic viscosity. Yeah. Yeah. Who is voting for kinematic viscosity? So it's called kinematic viscosity. Okay, so this kinematic viscosity you get when you define, what was this again? Eta. Eta divided by density. And this was an absolute viscosity. And now you get the values that are actually used in a simulation. So this kinematic viscosity, that's the one that we're going to later use when we define the lamina flow. And again, the flow time is not very common, but maybe needed in some cases. Now the SI units for kinematic viscosity is a, is an area divided by sec. And that's, a, you know, the stroke and the centi strokes are often used SI units for viscosity. And now we're speaking about kinematic viscosity. Now you may wonder like, okay, what about this, uh, you know, SIA units, which is a Society of Automotive Engineering. That's uh, American Association. Is it, I think it is American Association. And they want to use their own definition for viscosity, which is not uh, based on the SI units. And uh, the relationship between the, you know, Society of Automotive Engineering and the center strokes are listed in this table. Maybe a little less important for you, but still something that is good to know. So the sign, which is a society of automotive engineering, automotive, automotive engineers, is not the SI unit, which is not a big surprise because this is an American society, but we're gonna use center strokes and the center strokes, and those are the, the units that follows the SI principle. Now, Viscosity, as you probably are so aware of, is very heavily a function of temperature. You know, just to give you an idea how heavily it is a function of temperature, you know, here is a you know one example that's the, what I have in this picture here in x axis is the temperature. So this is minus 20 degrees, this is 100 degrees, and this is then centi strokes, uh, which is a kinematic viscosity. You can see that it's heavily function of temperature. And this is what you pretty much already know, because if you have those, I don't know if you are one of those rally people, you know, driving the rally car, but one of the basic principles in a rally, that's what I have learned from the games, is that you first need to warm up your engine. So you need to warm up your engine. So that's why in a Formula One, they first go with this first lap without not speeding that much, then the engine is ready, so make sure that the viscosity of the engine is in a certain level, and then the full throttle ahead. I guess in uh, Formula One they have techniques that they could call a full throttle ahead from the first second, but this is kind of like you know, the traditional way to warm up the engine, make sure that the, the viscosity is in a, you know, in a level where that's supposed to be, and then you're ready to go. Okay, that's uh, for engines but we're gonna discuss about hydraulics. For us too, you know, it could be significant. There may be cases when there is a lamina flow, and when there's a lamina flow, then the temperature will make a really, really significant effect. Okay, but now comes the, the most important message of today. So let's discuss about lamp fluid theory. And the lamp fluid theory is the principle how is that you can model the hydraulics when you look at the hydraulic circuits. Now, there's a little bit of discussion here. So, first of all, it's a very common and very simple concept. And this is what I would like you to understand, because for sure I will ask that in a written exam. Now, <coughs> this, this lamp fluid theory applies well for a system where there's no acoustic waves. Acoustic pressure waves could be something that you know, there may be a you know, hose line. Hold on. Let me make a drawing here. So maybe a hose line here. And then uh, you can introduce uh, the flow inside of the hose. And then you can, there is a valve that you can close and open really, really rap rapid. Because it's extremely rapid closing and opening. It's possible that there is a pressure waves that are traveling back and forth in this hose line. Probably not in a hose line. But uh, you know some other components in pipelines, perhaps they may be traveling back and forth. And these are 
traveling in a, in a speed of you know, acoustic waves. Now, this is something that we cannot capture by using this technique. But instead, when using this technique, we are assuming that in certain area, a certain particular location of the hydraulic volume, we assume pressure to be equally distributed. So now you need to listen to me. So they must be equally distributed. The next slide will be one of the most important slides in this topic, and I will show you an example. Not next, but one after that. So it works in, in many of the applications, but if you have something that there is extremely rapid motion, rapid closing and openings, then you maybe you need to be aware of this limitation. Okay, it means that in a mobile machine there is a relatively slow pipelines, kind of short and uh, you know um, slow work cycles. So it uh, applies well to this application. So what we're going to do within this um, concept, we're going to form differential equations to each one of the volumes. And this is where we have to follow this uh, application or this assumption that pressure is equally distributed. Uh, I have a few examples in that. And then the volumes are assumed to be separated by throttles. In practice, they are separated by different kind of valves, which may be direction valve, pressure compensated valve, pressure release valve, whatever. But what, regardless of what, what is that valve, we always consider the valve to be a throttle that is separating different volumes, and then we're simply controlling or we're computing the how much flow is going through the throttle. That's the kind of the basic principle. Now, as mentioned here, direct pressure, direction pressure, flow valves, all these components are considered by a throttle in this modeling concept. Okay, let's look at this. So this tells you what's the idea of the ground fluid theory. You know, I have here very simple hydraulic circuit that consists of two containers. The one container is here in, a, you know, up from the piston. So this is a piston. So this is a piston rod. So this could be a, a damper. Now, the first thing that I need to do here is that I have to look like, okay, where is that the pressure is equally distributed within this hydraulic circuit? And there's obviously two different volumes. So can I make an assumption that the pressure here, any given time, say pressure one, is equal than the pressure here, pressure two? Is it valid to say pressure one is equal than the pressure two? Yes. So this is yes or no? Yes. So you can say that it is equal. Mm -hmm. Okay any given time, any circumstances of the system. Say, certain times that I'm pressing this, you know, if there's a, you know, if you have really high force, then uh, you can take this high force, pressing the, this piston downwards. Is this still valid? No, it's still yes or no? No. But you say yes. I said yes if we are not pushing, but I okay. Push. If it is standing still, is yes, mm -hmm. but they sorry. Okay. Apparently, today's computer didn't do the job. Well, no, no. This is not the computer. This is uh, this is uh, because of the iPad. You know what I need next? You iPad. Yeah, I have it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it coming back? <coughs> All right, one more thing that I need to do is this one here. I know the principle is the same. Okay, so it's coming back. How is this how is the streaming? Is that our no it's back yeah, right? It's back on there. Okay. So uh yeah. Now this is typically what happens in the dampers. So if you move with the piston back and forth, up and down. The pressure in different chambers will change for different ways. So we cannot say that the pressure in a chamber not, chamber number one is always equal than the pressure in a chamber number two. So it's not equal. And if they are not equal, then we cannot model them by using just one differential equation. But we have to use a two differential equations. But can we make an assumption that the pressure, say, in this upper Left corner is same than here, upper, I mean, lower right corner. 
Is that a solid assumption? Yes, it is. Yes, it is, because there is nothing that introducing pressure losses between these two locations. And now, because of that, I could use one differential equation to compute the pressures in one side of the piston. Another side of the piston, I will use another differential equation, another set of effective bulk models, another set of equations that describe the volume. And then what con connects these two components is a throttle, which in reality is this symbol trillings between or through the piston. And now this trilling will introduce the flow that's trying to equalize the pressure difference. So that's the whole cause of the hydraulic model. So what we're gonna do is that we will create the differential equation for this volume and for this volume, and then we can estimate the pressure for any given time of the system. That's pretty much it, because the force that is coming out from the damper, it will be actually, you know, the pressure one multiplied by corresponding cross-section area. The corresponding cross-section area will be this one here. Then that will be minus pressure to uh, multiplied by corresponding cross-section area. So the pressure is the one that is uh, not the constant value, or is not having the constant value. Cross-section will remain constant because it's not changing when the system is moving. Okay? Makes sense. You got the concept. Come slowly, but it comes. So it's yes. Would you like me to repeat it? No, thanks. Okay. Okay, here's an example. Uh, hopefully this is clear enough for you guys. So what I have here is a you know, system that consists of pressure source. The pressure source is this one here, so this is assumed to be able to produce the constant pressure for this system. Then I have here direction valve. This direction valve consists of three different locations, connects four different ports. Then I have hose that is connected or connecting this direction valve. This component, by the way, is called counterbalance valve, which is used in order to prevent the rapid motion of the piston. So it's a little bit complicated component, but it's using the pillar drill trials here, uh, drills here. And then this one is connected to piston, piston side. Then the piston rod side here is connected to the valve directly to the tank. Now when the valve is in this position, what are the differential equations needed in order to compute? You know, first one is a pressure source, which you know, may be given to you. So you don't need to form the differential equation to compute that. Then the next one is the area that is associated to this hose line. So we have to compute the pressure within this hose line. We must, because we cannot make an assumption that the pressure here is equal to the pressure here. And why not? Because of the counterbalance valve. Counterbalance valve may introduce a pressure losses, but because of this possibility, we have to compute the pressures in these two different locations. Okay, makes sense. What about the piston rod side? Now here, the pressure that is applying here and all the way the hose line can be assumed to be constant. Because we are making an assumption that the hose itself will not introduce the pressure losses. So this is where I can calculate the pressures in a piston rod side. And then there's a throttle, which in reality is this direction valve and then this connected to tank. You got the idea. Yes? Because the next one, what I have here, is this one. You know, a little bit of different kind of system, but I'm asking, okay, how many volumes, or how many differential, how is that you can simplify this hydraulic circuit in order to convert the, the pressure that is needed in order to, to estimate the force produced by all the, this hydraulic unit. Okay, so I have here, again, four different choices. Let me put the squeeze on, but I, but I, I want to explain this to you.
Okay? So let's go back here. So the first option, I think this is exactly the same that in the previous case. So exactly the same amount of volumes and exactly the same concept in the previous case. Then in the next option, I have you no know, pressure source and then uh, two different volumes where the pressure is computed. Then as option number C, I have pressure source and only the one location where the pressure is computed. And in uh, option number D, I have pressure source and three places where the pressure is computed. And now you need to be the one, you need to go and uh, select the one that is uh, describing the hydraulic circuit where I have here pressure source that is connected to direction valve. The direction valve is something that there is a three different operation condition and it connects three different ports. And uh, as it's shown in this picture, the pressure source is connected to the hose line and the hose line is then connected to hydraulic cylinder. And uh, that's how it is. Okay, let me erase this to make it more clear. So this is a big puzzle. So let me close the door to make uh, this a little more comfortable place. Okay, so before you enter in your hands, make sure that you understand the concept. And uh, it is all right to discuss with your fellow student. So if you feel a little bit shy about this question, go ahead and knock your fellow student and ask, okay, what it is? What's your answer? But make sure that when you're asking this from your fellow student, it must be a good student. <laughs> so you go ahead and just Okay? But what it is? Which one it is correct? Can you uh, show me a little bit about the options? Somehow, okay, okay, so. Would you like to. No, I can give you a little bit of help if you want. Yeah. Okay. The first very important observation is that what kind of cylinder are we speaking about? Are we going to speak about the cylinder that is a two-way cylinder or one-way cylinder? So what's the difference of that? You know, this is a cylinder, hold on, where the pressure is applying in a both side of the piston. So the pressure is applying in a, here in the piston side and also in the piston rod side. But there is also possible to have a suit that there is no connection from piston rod side to anywhere. And if that's the case, then you should eliminate all these computing. So you don't need this, these equations because there is no connection. There is no possibility to introduce the pressures in the piston rod side. So that already el eliminates one option from the next slide. Then the next thing is that you need to think about how many places you need to, or how many different volumes you need to distribute the size, this line here, here, you know, where the pressure source is connected to hose, hose goes to one component and then the cylinder. So now, in this case, we need, you know, this pressure source, which was this guy here, that, let me erase a little more to make it more visible. Then we needed, uh, you know, this hose line that was needed here, and the finally this one here, all because of this component, this counterbalance valve. Now, what if you don't have the counterbalance valve? How that will affect? It will, is it going to increase the number of volumes or decrease the number of volumes? That's the question. Increase, yes. What? Decrease. Decrease. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay. Now, so, uh, okay, so first option, some, you know, think about what I just explained. The next option, 
is exactly like in the previous case. C is uh, with one less volume, D is one more volume. You know what's the answer? Okay, can I take a look? What if, what if, hypothetically, you know, this is, you know, really hypothetically, what if we're gonna score 100%? What are we gonna do then? We're gonna go and have a coffee? No? Why not? Yes, the coffee is in a table. So rest of the course, you know, no matter how it's in class, which if it is 100% success rate, it's gonna be coffee. I mean, you guys, online participants, I don't know how to offer a coffee for online participants. It's a virtual, virtual coffee, some coffee. Why should you rethink about that? Because the number of students are just increasing. Yeah. Yeah, now we have 65 students. Cool. It's going to cost me a lot, 65 euros. But it's so much fun to me. Yeah. And I'm really wealthy, you know, my, I have really nice bicycle. So I can solve my bicycle to offer you a car. Okay, so let's leave this for a few seconds and we will get back to that soon. Now, how is it we can compare the, the pressure in these locations? That's what I would like to explain next. So how is it we can get this <coughs> differential equation that describes the pressure in any given time? <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> okay, so you got okay, so should we go back to this because I think it is Can I close this? Yes. You guys are ready? Okay. Well maybe I'm not bring too much. Maybe I should actually do it down at least a little bit. Because now I'm you know you know, my self-confidence became, you know, becoming bigger and bigger, and I'm, you know, next thing that I'm offering is, is a lunch and, you know, a, you know, dinner in the restaurant and everything, and then eventually it's going to be 100% that I'm spooked. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. But this time, still, the offer is about coffee, so can we see? <laughs> Close case. But not 100%. Okay, let's go back here. This line, oh, hold on. This line. Okay, like we discussed, this is completely out of the question. Completely out of the question because the piston rock side is not connected to anywhere. There is no hose or no pipeline that leaves here from, from piston rock side to anywhere. It is closed. So this case is not possible. The second case would be this pressure here, which is this one here, then this pressure here, that is this one here, but this third one will be for no need. So obviously the option number C is the correct one. This is not the correct one because we don't need this many volumes to compute the hose line that is here to here. Okay, so that's the end of the story. Okay, but now, what follows is that I will explain that how, you, how is it you can get this uh, differential equation to compute the pressures at any given time. Now, in order to get this differential equation, we have to look at the, the control unit, or the control container. And the control container is like piece of pipe or whatever you wanted to describe this. And now I'm looking like how much is of mass flow in and mass flow out on my control unit. Now, this system is like I have flow rate that is coming in and the flow rate having the certain density. And, you know, some other density and the corresponding flow rate is going up. Now, if there's any difference between the incoming and outgoing mass rate, that the mass within this control volume is either increasing or decreasing. Correct. Okay. So basically, using this symbol, oh, hold on, hold on. 
this incoming and outgoing uh, mass flow, this is the kind of the thing that I can use in order to, to control the mass within this volume. Okay. How is the mass within this volume? Well, that's simply the density multiplied by volume size. And now, if I think about, you know, how is the mass, how that can change, is exactly what I like I explained. So it must be the difference in incoming and outgoing the mass flow rate. And if there's a, you know, more coming in than more co than going out, the mass increase. Another way around, the mass will decrease. So that's my differential equation. The change of the mass can be expressed as it is shown here. Now, obviously, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to use these relations and I'm going to substitute these relations to my differential equation that is shown here. Okay? And I'm going to also use this relation so I will get the equation as shown here. So I have here uh, time differentiation of the, of the density and the volume. And this is mass flow in, mass flow out. Okay. Now, with a little bit of uh, mathematical manipulation, basically, I'm executing this uh, operation here. I will get the density change with respect to time, but the volume change with respect to time. And then again, mass flow in and the mass flow out. This is how it is. Now, if I'm assuming that the density of the fluid that is coming in and going out is the same, then I can simplify the equation by simply ignoring the, the density. So I can take it off here, so it come in here. So then my equation look like the one that is shown here. Now I have flow rate in and flow rate out. And here I have a density difference with respect to time. And then this is a volume divided by density. And this is a change of the volume itself. Okay? You're with me? Oh, you don't care because you want to see how is the final outcome of all this. You kind of with me, stuff. Now it makes sense to do this because otherwise I need to go back and explain this again. But basically, we're still in this control volume, and we're looking if the mass can change. It's all about how much is coming in and how much is going out. That's what it is. Okay. Now. Then I'm going to use a relation, and I thought that I can explain this relation to you uh, with help of a little bit of math, but now I don't remember the, how it actually went. I think it went like this way, that the mass, well, the, excuse me, the volume multiplied by density, I think it was like, yeah, this is the, my original equation, equal than the, can it be like this? Yeah, this is the equation. Well, this is a minus here, so it uh, should be minus equal to zero. So this is where it comes, so this kind of mathematical relation is coming, this equation. Now we're gonna use this equation together with the definition of both models. So we can say, see, the difference of the, the density is gonna be equal to the, the uh, the difference in the pressure multiplied by density divided by both models. Now, when can I substitute that? Can I get an equation that is almost the one that I'm going to use in order to compute the pressures at any given time? I'm going to simply take, you know, this part and put it in the left hand side. I'm going to take this one here and put it in the left hand side of the equation. And then what is left is a pressure difference with respect to time. Now, this is when all that happened already. So this equation I have here, P dot, and now with help of these time integration techniques, I can actually take the P dot and I can get the P, which is a pressure at any given time. So again, the similar idea that in a multi-body system dynamics, but in a multi-body system dynamics, we were using <coughs> acceleration, or maybe not this way, with acceleration of generalized coordinates. and acceleration, we came down to velocity. And for velocity, we came down to position. Here, from P dot, we're coming to P. And that's exactly what we need in order to estimate the forces in different hydraulic components. Now, this is a first order differential equation. That's what we're going to use in hydraulics over and over again. OK. Is it making sense? 
you're already familiar with this equation from the Carter tutorials, correct? You have used it already or you don't remember that? Both. Okay, no comments this time, or is there any comments? Okay, this is something that I need to explain a little further because uh, the next in class quiz is all about like where is that we can apply this technique. There's a limitation. Remember the limitation of what I mentioned in the very beginning? And now I'm asking like, plant fluid theory ignores something. The first option is that the pressure waves within the hydraulic volume, this change of the size of the hydraulic volume. Basically what you need to do is that you need to look at this equation. Next, um, let me explain what I have in this equation. You know, let me first erase this. The component that I have in this equation are effective valve modulus that is describing the flexibility, compressibility. Well, let's call it flexibility of the hydraulics. All right? Then volume size, which is just defining like what is the physical size of the volume you wanted to look at. Then flow rate in, flow rate out. Same change of the volume. And this could be the case if you have this, let me make a drawing, if you have the hydraulic cylinder like this, you wanted to compute the, the pressure in this volume, that is uh, this container plus this hose here. Because the piston go back and forth, up and down, this, this case, this volume here comes bigger and smaller. So this effect is accounted by this component. The flow rate that is coming in and leaving out there are these two components. This again is effective bulk modulus. This is the size of the volume. So with help of that explanation, you should be able to ex you know, then enter your answer to this question, which is plant fluid theory, basically. This first order differential equation, what is the thing that is, it is ignored? So options are press of waves within the hydraulic volume, change of the size of the hydraulic volume, physical size of the hydraulic volume, compressibility of the hydraulic volume. Would you like to see that? Well, let me write this equation for you. So it's a P dot equal then the effective part modulus divided by volume size, flow rate in, flow rate out, and then this was a volume change. Okay, then, then uh, back here. So uh, next one, plant fluid theory ignores. Which one is, oh, hold on. This and this. And this is it then. After you answer this, this question, you can go back home. Because we had a 10 minutes break, and it's uh, five to four, so it's an uh, hour and a half in total. Maybe you want to stay a little while to see how is a score from this question. Because there's always possibility that it's 100%. It will happen. It will. It will. One day it will. Maybe it's a final lecture. And then it's going to be like one big, very happy family with a 100% success rate. Coffee. Let's let's make it coffee. Free drinking. <laughs> okay. But now let's see how is it? Maybe it's this. Maybe it's what maybe it's gonna happen today. Possible. You don't think so. No. No, no, it's gonna be more than seventy percent for sure. So it, I, I'm thinking that it's going to be um, 90, 90%. 97, by the way, keep, you know, this is a this is very important observation that it was the highest percentage so far. 97 is so close to 100%. Is this close?
but no pressure. But let me tell you that uh, last year we scored 100% once. No pressure. <laughs> what did they have at the game? What did they have? Oh yeah, yeah. We went, uh, you know, around the planet. So we were traveling together. <laughs> we had a party of the full summer. So that would happen. <laughs> I think they're still, you know, having parties. They are not yet in the university. Maybe they're coming back sometimes in a Christmas. Maybe. Okay. So can we see? Let me take a look. Like how is the situation here? So uh, 40, last time, it, I think it was 40, uh, what was the number of students here? 40, 47 or something. 42. Okay, 42, uh, it seems that it's not increasing any longer. Can I close this? You guys all done? Okay, so is it or is it not? It's not. I mean 100%, so that's what I'm asking. It's 80, 85. 80, 85. <laughs> <laughs> Statistically, it's going to happen. Next week, it will happen. Because 80, 89. You're very, very good. Very good. Okay. But let me close the, the streaming and let me close the recording. And I'm going to see you next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, by the way, will be a lecture about you know flow times a little bit about the modeling of hydraulic components and then uh, that's it then we're ready to move on to quick pleasant topics such as this uh, real time simulation and verification okay remember this week tutorials there's a monitor manu that is helping you to use maybe and I think it is quite nice experience because if you want to make a game of yourself by yourself, that's the way it goes. So you can con you can actually attach your model to control controllers like joystick or keyboard or whatever you want, and then you're good to go. Okay. See you on uh, Tuesday.